Well, hello everybody. It's so wonderful to see you all here. I do have one note to our tech person that I would like to share my screen and I don't seem to be able to. Um, yeah, it's been disabled. So maybe that can be solved in the meantime, but let, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Janneke van der Weide. Oh, and I can now share my screen. Isn't that lovely? Um, so I can take you along with our, um, our uh, presentation. Um, I'm one of the fortunate people that, uh, that are called code breakers and checkers that is involved uh, in the subject at hand. Um, and actually in this session, we are going to be talking about the West Yorkshire Archive Services and Lister Di Diary Transcription Project. Um, and whoever thought of that name, it's quite a mouthful. Um, a lot of you will have heard about this project before, and actually some of you, um, many of you may even have contributed, but whether you are well seasoned on the subject or if you're fairly new on everything related to Sandlister, don't worry, this session will get you totally up to date. Here is what you can expect. In a minute, I will introduce the panel and then the panelists will take us through some presentations. After this, there'll be time for questions and answers. And if you have any, please feel free to share them in the Zoom chat so that we can address them later on. As I said, we're joined in the session by four panelists and I will take a moment to introduce them to you all. Now, for those of you who are here live today and not in the recording later, we will just have had a session with Ruth and Jenny. However, I will just give them a, a new introduction because you know, if we're looking to a recording later, we want to know who they are. So Ruth Cummins is the Calderdale Archivist at the West Yorkshire Archive Service and is responsible for caring for and providing access to the Calderdale Archive collections. She quotes, I quote her saying, being a part of the diary transcription project has been an immense joy. The passionate code breakers are what make this project so amazing. And it's great to be part of sharing Anne's diaries with the world. Jenny Wood is archive assistant at the Calderdale office of the West Yorkshire Archive Services and has been the lead on the diary transcription project since April 21. Being a long distance swimmer and runner, the project is her latest and favorite endurance challenge. She feels it's a great privilege to be able to share Anne's life and the work of the code breakers and to be able to do it with such a great team is a joy. Jane Kendall is a retired lawyer and a very proud Anne Lister codebreaker who is grateful to have the opportunity to continue working with the archive service as the journal transcription project continues. She deeply admires and identifies with Anne Lister and is passionate about doing all she can to help make Anne Lister and her brilliant, inspiring journals accessible to the world. Kerstin Holzgrebe is teacher, researcher, codebreaker and checker. She's interested in Anne Lister because of the complexity of her character and her interests, as well as the early 19th century and the way it shapes our lives today. Kirsten considers joining the WYAS transcription project one of the best decisions she ever made. Now, without much further ado, let's go into the presentation and the first person I will hand over to is Ruth. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so thank you for sort of inviting us to speak about the project in this session. Uh, uh, so I'm going to start with sort of quick introduction to the diary transcription project. So the Anne Lister Diary Transcription Project, which is run by the West Yorkshire Archive Service, is a remote volunteer project to transcribe all of Anne Lister's diaries, which is a sort of total estimated word count of about 5 million words. Um, and to make these transcriptions freely available alongside images of the diaries on our online catalogue. So to give you a little bit of information about the diaries themselves, uh, there are 24 diaries, as well as two sort of early notebook style diaries uh, and loose pages. There are also 14 travel journals, which are smaller notebooks, which are ideal for recording diary entries while traveling. Um, the travel journals are also a part of this project. Um, so the diaries date from 1806 to Anne's death in 1840. Approximately one sixth of the um, diaries are written in a code. So it's a combination of Greek and algebraic terms um, without any word breaks or punctuation. 
The code was cracked in the 1890s by John Lister, who was the last Lister to live at Shibden Hall, uh, and his friend Arthur Burrell. After John's death in the 1930s, Arthur handed the key to the code over to Halifax Borough Council, who had taken it over Shibden Hall and made it into the wonderful museum it is today. Um, so the Shibden Hall archive collection is now held at uh, the Calderdale office of the West Yorkshire Archive Service. Um, and it contains documents dating as far back as the 13th century, as well as Anne's famous diaries, um, which have been in inscribed on the UNESCO UK Memory of the World Register in 2011 for their substantial uh, cultural significance. So now I'll move on to sort of launching the project and how the diary project came about. So that's next slide, please. There we go. Um, so how did the diary transcription project come about? So over the years, parts of Anne's diaries had been transcribed by notable researchers such as Helena Whitbread uh, and Jill Liddington, uh, but nobody had attempted to undertake the mammoth task that would be transcribing all five million words. Um, this would have taken one person years and years, if not decades, um, to do using the microfilm copies of the diaries, which were being used to provide access to the diaries at the time. So in 2018, as part of a joint project with Calderdale Museums and with the generous support of Sally Wainwright um, and this Welcome Screenwriters Fellowship, the diaries were digitised. So high quality digital images of each page of the diaries were created. This meant that these images could be added to our online catalogue and be viewed from anywhere in the world. It also meant that we no longer needed to rely on those old microfilm copies of the diaries that we had, um, which were much more difficult to read than the uh, digitised images. So the time was right for a transcription project. So the service and my wonderful predecessor, Don Sudron, um, set about planning for a remote transcription project. So guidelines and guidance were created. Um, as well as a test transcription page. So the page on screen right now was the test transcription page. Um, following on from the huge success of the wonderful Gentleman Jack in uh, 2019, the transcription project was launched in July of that year. Um, so then the call out for voluntary transcribers received a phenomenal response um, with code breakers from all over the world taking up the challenge. Um, so over the course of the project, there's have been over 180 code breakers um, and it's an absolute joy. The code breakers are what make it an absolute joy to work on this project. So each of the diary pages was sent out to two code breakers um, so that we would have two transcriptions of each page. They were assigned in batches of 10 at a time. Um, so the hashtag and list of code breaker uh, meant that this community of code breakers from across the world could communicate with each other as they transcribed these pages. So setting out to achieve such a huge task of transcribing 5 million words, which I guess is technically 10 million because each word was transcribed twice. I feel like we, we don't say that enough. Um, we didn't know exactly how long this would take. Uh, so by August 2021, we'd got back two transcriptions of each page, meaning that it took just a little over two years. Um, which is an unbelievably phenomenal achievement. Um, so once the transcriptions are completed and checked, they're published for free on our online catalog. So there's two images from our online catalog on screen now. Um, so the full diary can be viewed as a PDF and then transcriptions for each page of the diary are added into the description box on the online catalog for that page of the diary. Um, this means that once completed, the entire diaries will be keyword searchable. So if you wanted to know how many times Anne mentioned Mariana, which, you know, is going to be a lot, um, you will be able to do this by using that keyword searchable function. So the full PDFs of the diary sort of that we were in initially making available online were what we call marked up. So this means that all of Anne's many abbreviations um, have been expanded to show the full word um, with square brackets to indicate which words, which letters are omitted. Um, a non-marked up version is created, which has the abbreviated words in full, but without the square brackets. Um, and this is added to the online catalog in the description boxes, which makes it keyword searchable. 
Um, after receiving feedback from readers about the transcriptions, uh, the decision was taken to also produce a full PDF of the non-marked up version, um, which can be a little bit easier to read from an accessibility standpoint. So new diary transcription releases will have these and then we'll go back and add them uh, to previous diaries that, that didn't have them. So there'll be two versions, a marked up version and a non-marked up version that you can read um, in PDF full. So the progress so far. Um, so far, transcriptions are available for 1806 up to the 19th of June, 1824, with a whopping 1,247,131 words available. I was doing some Googling earlier about other diaries and the word counts of them to see if we'd beat Samuel Pepys's famous diary yet. 1.25 million words, so we're almost there. Um, but we've got a long way to go before the longest diary in the world, which is apparently 37.5 million words long. Um, so as I'd sort of mentioned earlier, um, even though 100% of the transcriptions have been returned, the project is far from over. Um, so each of the pages need to be carefully compared and checked prior to publication. So I'm now going to hand over to Jenny to discuss how the checking stage came about. Thank you. So um, Jane's going to discuss exactly how the checking process works. But to start with, I just want to give an introduction about how this phase of the project came about and how the codebreakers came to be a part of it. So in the beginning, when the project was initially set up by Sandra Dan Sudron in 2019, the plan was to keep all the checking done in house. Um, so this was done between a team of three of us, two of which only worked part time. And it was done in between normal day to day archive tasks. So I know it's hard to believe that this isn't the Anlister archive, it's the Coldale archives. And we do have other things to do every now and again. So whenever we had some spare time, we would compare transcripts to make a checked version of the transcript ready for that to go online. Um, as this was only done in and amongst the normal run into the Coldsdale office, it was hard to keep any momentum. And I find that when checking pages, it has a certain rhythm and a flow to it. And when you can check pages consistently, it's easy. But when you check one page and then stop and then maybe a week goes by and you come back to it, it becomes a real hard task. I mean, code breakers might find that, you know, you have an eye for Anne's handwriting and once you've been away from it a while, it can sometimes take a while to come back. So it was slow going for us. And on top of all of this, the momentum of the code breakers was just incredible. The speed in which the transcriptions were completed was outstanding. There was 7,720 pages done in two years. You know, it was literally an award winning effort as shown by the ARA Volunteer Award in 2021. Anyway, all of this meant that there was no way we could produce the check pages as fast as the transcripts were coming up to us. So during COVID, like many other places, a lot of our work went quiet and we finally had time to turn our attention fully to checking transcripts. Like we've heard so much from so many code breakers, the transcription project was a lifeline for us during lockdown. It gave us focus, it gave us a consistency and routine. And most importantly, it gave us a link to the outside world when like we'd all been cut off physically. During this time, checking transcripts became my main role and I spent on average about probably 90% of my working week just comparing pages. Dan, who created the project, also created a wonderful spreadsheet that kept log of everything we do with the project, including a running total of the completed percentage. So keep in mind that there's just short 4,000 images that needed transcriptions. We'd spend all day checking these. At the end of each day, we'd update on the log of what we'd completed and see the percentage go up by around 0.25%. And after you're thinking you'd had a great day and got loads done, that percentage figure just took the wind right out of your sails. So by the time life was starting to return to normal, and we'd checked three full journals, which was 10% of the overall total, which was good going. But obviously we were about to go back into normal life. Um, at this point, I'd just like to point out that there's no rush to complete the project. Our main priority is 
it's to get everything finished as accurately as possible, not as quickly as possible. But at the same time, to witness firsthand the effort and dedication and the emotion that the code breakers have given to this project, it's been truly moving. And I feel incredibly fortunate to have been witness to it. You know, no code breaker has completed the pages in order for them to sit in our file plan. You know, they were transcribed to be shared and made use of. And I feel the biggest respect we can give to the code breakers for their efforts is to produce the final transcripts in a somewhat timely manner. You know, it'd be truly tragic for them to sit there indefinitely. Um, so in April 2021, whilst the first phase, first phase of the project was still ongoing, uh, I took the lead on the project. Dan unfortunately left us. Um, and in that time, I got to know a lot of the code breakers quite well, and it became clear just how knowledgeable people were, not just about Anne, but also her writing style. As the transcriptions were nearing completion, I had a lot of offers of extra help from code breakers, and I decided to try and make use of this great resource of knowledge and test whether the checking phase was something we could work with people remotely on. Um, I have had a lot of things to consider whilst designing that, such as would the code breakers enjoy it? Checking is very different to transcribing. It can be incredibly tedious at times. And there are some people that have like tried the checking process and gone, you know what, thanks for letting me try, but it's not for me. Um, the sense of community was obviously such a major part of the project's success. And I worried, you know, would that continue with such a small team. Um, Kirsten's going to talk more shortly on how we collaborate together to try and keep that feeling going. And most importantly, could consistency be maintained? Um, Dan's idea to keep the, the checking done in house originally was to keep consistency. And obviously, that was something we didn't want to lose. So to begin with, I wrote out some guidelines and recruited two code breakers to test the process for me. Um, as expected, a number of questions came back about how to approach different things, but along with questions, both also offered suggestions on things that we hadn't previously considered in the archive service. So it was, you know, a great learning source for us as well. And from there, we adapted the guidelines and recruited five other checkers. I wanted to keep the team small for two reasons. One, to help ensure the consistency, and two, to help us manage our workload. In the early stages, I had so many questions come back to me, which was great and what we wanted in order to flag up issues and ultimately make the best version of the transcripts we could. Um, but had the team been bigger, my response time would have been a lot longer and would have ultimately delayed the process. Uh, the initial idea of the checking team was to speed the process of releasing diaries up. Um, also, in this new way, I'm now working alongside the team rather than behind them which was the process before. So along with speeding up the process, it means we can catch mistakes sooner rather than later down the line. So once the first team were up and running, we put out a call to recruit a second team. And as I said before, checking is very different to transcribing. And I think that was really highlighted by the fact that of all the test pages that were sent out, only around a third of them came back. And from here, five more code breakers were selected and formed a second group. So the team is doing an absolutely wonderful job and has taken the process even further than we've thought by things by reading each line. Um, Jane will explain the process later, but basically it works on us. It works on word flagging differences to us, whereas when we were, everything was doing in-house, we would look at the differences, but now we have such a dedicated team, they work through reading each line and making sure that everything is correct. You know, I really have to thank like the whole checking team for their patience and understanding with changes that we've made as we've gone on, because as we've gone on, some guidelines that are in place right at the start, we've gone and back and changed and adapted. And uh, Kirsten's gonna talk more on how we and they collaborate with each other to come come to these decisions. There are still a number of levels of checks that go on in-house. So as Ruth explained earlier, each page would go to two transcribers and that comes back to us to check. 
we then send each of those two pages to two checkers who each create one version they come back to me and we check it again so there are different levels of the process which will hopefully just mean the whole process becomes even more accurate um, unlike the checks that the checkers do mine are now a lot quicker because i'm checking two pages that have already been checked rather than the original versions so at this point i did want to give a predicted timeline of the project but i think it's too difficult to do at this point when the process first started i was really optimistic i'm like yeah by december next year everything will be done but it's kind of too hard to predict so many different factors at play, such as Anne's pages, for one. How clear was her handwriting? So rather than trying to give a predicted timeline, I thought I'd just give some statistics about what's been happening. So the Checkers all team all came on board in August, September last year. So from then until now, three diaries have gone online. We have three diaries in various, various stages of completion and we have two diaries that are currently being worked, in on, worked on. So that is eight diaries in a year that have been looked at, completed, almost completed, or in the works. And that is a far greater figure than we, we could have achieved without them. So, you know, to the team that are on the panel now and to anyone watching or anyone that's in the team, I want to say a massive thank you because those figures are brilliant. Okay, so I'm going to pass over to Jane now to explain exactly what goes on. All right. Uh, thank you, Jenny. Uh, I'm Jane. I'm going to talk with you about how we got started on the transcription checking phase, where we are now. Uh, as Jenny said last summer, uh, the transcription phase was complete, and the archive service began to prepare for the next phase. And uh, Again, as Jenny described, each journal page had been transcribed by two members of the Codebreakers team. And so the next task would be to compare those two transcripts. And if they differed from each other in any ways, to look at those differences and try to resolve them. The, best, the basic idea was to simply follow this process. First, use Microsoft Word to create a comparison between the two transcripts of the journal page. And here's an example showing how Word makes it obvious when the two are not identical. Next, for each difference, look at the image of the journal page from the Archive Services online catalog. And the middle image here on this slide shows you how that would look. Then determine which of the two interpretations appears to match what Anne wrote. And the words underlined in red correspond to the differences that Word identified. So these would be the focus. The image at the bottom shows how the checker resolved each difference. The checker would also refer to the transcription guidelines furnished by Jenny to make sure they've been applied. And here, the red arrows point to the AND sign. Our guidelines direct us to spell this out as A-N-D, as you see highlighted. And finally, once all the differences have been resolved and the guidelines applied, we'd name the completed transcript following Jenny's instructions to show that it had been checked and which of us had checked it. To test the concept, as Jenny mentioned, she worked with me and another transcriber who gave the process a try. She was looking for input as to how, if at all, the process should be fine-tuned to assure that the checked transcripts would be as accurate and consistent as possible. As the trial run proceeded and the various issues were identified, the checking process was flushed out more. It quickly became apparent that a word comparison might miss some things that needed to be fixed. For example, sometimes both code breakers interpreted a word the same way, but their interpretation wasn't consistent with the most recent guidelines. This could easily happen because the guidelines remained in flux during the transcription phase, as both the code breakers and the archive service gained more experience in reading Anne's handwriting and her code. The guidelines sometimes needed to be updated. For this reason, pages that were transcribed earlier in the process might not be consistent with the current guidelines. 
But since both transcribers followed the, the guidelines that were in effect at the time, Word wouldn't see any difference. For example, here you can see how the guidelines evolved about how to transcribe Anne's two ways of abbreviating Mariana's name. In addition, especially in the early days of the project or when a particular code breaker was new, some of Anne's journaling practices might have led to uncertainty. For example, once she had mentioned a person's name and spelled it out in its entirety in her journal, Anne would often abbreviate that name when she used it thereafter. Since there were lots of code breakers working on separate, often non-sequential batches of pages, a particular batch might include only the abbreviated name. To further complicate matters, because of Anne's typical abbreviation patterns, it might seem like a particular name, even though abbreviated, could be safely guessed. But while logical, this might result in both transcribers writing the name exactly the same way, but as it turns out, that guess wasn't the person's actual name. Word wouldn't show any difference, but an experienced checker might have come across the person's name before and realized that it's incorrect. Here on the slide, one example that came up in the trial run. At the top, you see how Anne abbreviated it. Neither code breaker saw the name spelled out in her batch, but both knew that Anne usually used this form of abbreviation when she omitted an E. So both of them transcribed it as strict. The actual name though is Mary Strickland, one of Anne's friends in York, someone an experienced checker would likely be familiar with. Another thing Anne did, uh, another thing Anne did when she wrote her coded portions of the journals was to omit all punctuation and capitalization. Transcribers were confronted with a stream of evenly spaced code and then had to try to figure out where one word ended and the next began. Most of the time, this was fairly obvious, but in some situations, there might be multiple possibilities which could lead to word divisions that weren't quite right. If both transcribers separated the words the same way, word wouldn't see any difference but an experienced checker might realize that a different way of dividing the words made more sense in context. In this example, the code breakers encountered the underlined part, a string of code for the letters A, S, I, D, E, B, U, T. Both of them saw that it could be divided up into the words as I debut and transcribed it that way. Since they both did it the same way, Word didn't see any difference. But an experienced checker looking very closely at the context would realize that the words aside but made more sense. Anne was saying that she had set aside an earlier agreement, but had done so kindly. You can see this more clearly at the bottom where I've added punctuation and capitalization. The trial runs also brought to light some situations in which the checkers might need to make judgment calls. For example, Anne's handwriting can be quite quirky, especially when it comes to capital letters. The example on your screen shows how tricky Anne's capital G could be, as in it looks just like her lowercase g. So there are times when one transcriber thought Anne wrote a capital letter and the other thought she didn't. Word will show that as a difference for the checker to resolve. In this instance, a checker might look for other occurrences of G on the page for clues and also consider the context. And here at the bottom, the checker has decided that the word Gothic should be capitalized. Other more unique situations also came up that required a judgment call. For example, sometimes Anne garbled a word by writing over a mistake or trying to correct one as she wrote. The resulting appearance of what she wrote might very well suggest the same word to two transcribers and yet still not be exactly right. Here in the middle image, Anne has first written her abbreviation for the word always, which you can see on the left, but then she attempted to change it into her abbreviation for also, which is shown on the right. Unfortunately, she forgot to cross out the YS of always, 
So both code breakers, understandably, transcribed it that way. But the checker, looking at it very closely in context, made a judgment call that the correct interpretation was also. Anne sent off her letter by George and sent also another letter. Finally, the trial run and the early days of the checking phase identified areas in which, for the sake of consistency, more guidance was needed. Jenny and Ruth have continued to address these as the checkers have brought them up and to refine and add to the guidelines as the process has progressed. This slide shows a few of the many things we now have guidance about. Kirsten will be talking more in a few minutes about our guidance document and other ways that the checkers and the archive service are working co collaboratively to produce the best possible final transcripts. By the end of the trial runs, Jenny was able to both confirm some of her earlier ideas and add some new recommendations for the checking phase. First, the trial runs confirmed that it would be best to recruit fairly experienced code breakers as ser to serve as checkers. More transcribing experience meant more familiarity with Anne's journaling practices, her way of expressing herself, and the people and places in her life. This, in turn, provides more confidence when judgment calls are needed. Second, we've moved away from the original concept of simply resolving the differences that a word comparison would identify. Our practice now is to follow along word for word with the image of Anne's written journal page as we go, not only resolving the differences, but also being on the lookout for things like those I've mentioned that word can't identify. Next, the trial run confirmed Jenny's recommendation that the number of checkers be limited to a fairly small group. As Jenny noted, this enables her and Ruth to keep up with the project because believe it or not, they have other duties, <laughs> just the Ann Lister journals. And it also helps to assure consistency in the way the final check transcripts are prepared. Fourth, yet another layer of checking has been added. I know I speak for all the checkers when I say that as a group, we're very meticulous and we're all very much focused on producing checked transcripts that are as accurate as they possibly can be. However, as we've all learned the somewhat embarrassing hard way, no matter how careful we're being, and no matter how comprehensive the guidelines, there, were still, there will still be situations in which the two people checking a given page will produce checked copies that are not identical. So as an extra safety net to try to get even greater accuracy, Jenny and Ruth are now taking the two checked transcripts for each page, comparing them and resolving any differences between the two. And then finally, the trial runs confirmed the need for a step Jenny and Ruth had already put into place to invite and log user identified issues once the transcripts are made publicly available. Even with all our best efforts and the many layered attempts to get to perfection, we know that things will still slip through the cracks and that careful readers and researchers might identify mistakes that need to be corrected. So as these are identified, Jenny and Ruth are logging them and they'll all be examined as and when they can be addressed. That concludes my part of the presentation. And now Kirsten will talk about the ways in which Jenny, Ruth, and the checkers are working together to produce the best possible results. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. I'm Kirsten. My part will be to talk about how Ruth, Jenny, and the checkers collaborate. And as Jane has mentioned, checking the transcripts would be impossible without collaboration. And the collaboration between everyone involved in transcribing and listers journals is what makes it so special. And as you all know, collaboration is still happening in so many different ways in and outside the transcription project on Twitter, in various Facebook groups and in collaborative groups like Pack with Potential or In Search of N Walker. So without collaboration, we wouldn't be able to solve the many little issues turning up while checking the transcripts. And yeah, I have to say this, working on this together, we have become close friends. Can we have the next slide? And I thought, yeah, when I prepared that talk, I was looking for uh, a quote, yeah, simply to illustrate how we feel about this. So we can't always be perfect, but we try to do our best. Right, so um, you have already heard the checkers who started out as code breakers 
didn't join the transcription project at the same time. And this is why we first had to find out which years in Anne's life we had transcribed and were familiar with. And the guidelines had been updated several times, which influenced the way code breakers dealt with difficult issues. For example, names in code and plain hand, margin symbols, capital letters, or book formats and mentioned in her journals. And we quickly became aware of these differences when the checking picked up speed in late summer 2021. And so first we set up a chat group to exchange ideas about the different ways of addressing the issues Jane spoke about. Now, here you can see examples of early discussions we collected in our first shared document. And it's quite funny and surprising how much time a group of people can spend discussing when to use a section sign or N's version of a hashtag for N's margin and footnote symbols when to use a capital letter, even if and didn't, or if lines should be skipped or not. So we realized it would make things very complicated and de delay the checking phase if each of us asked Jenny and Ruth a question separately. And in addition, we wouldn't know what had already been asked by someone else. So we decided to set up a shared document to collect all the queries and make it possible for Ruth and Jenny to comment on the issues we had identified. So what you can see here is the first page of our checkers rules document and the different colors stand for different checkers asking questions or commenting on them. And next, I want to show you some examples um, which were resolved by working like this. Well, Checking um, the transcripts, there were constant surprises, and there still are, as I will point out later. Like margin notes or different ways of emphasizing words or sentences, no one had encountered before, because we had joined the project at different times, and they hadn't been covered by the guidelines at that time. And sometimes we literally had to figure out which keys everyone had to press on our keyboards, depending on the operating systems everyone used, to produce an equivalent of the margin notes and used to highlight symbols or passages. A typical example can be seen here, the section sign, one of the index symbols and frequently used to single out important events and developments in her entries, which she also mentioned in her indexes. And sometimes Anne singled out section signs by adding dashes above or below or sometimes both, which can be very troublesome to reproduce without adding unwanted empty lines to the transcript. So we were quite relieved when Jenny presented us with the solution, which is Unicode symbol 035E. We also had to figure out how to deal with different kinds of lines and use to highlight passages down the main body of text, which you can see below. Now, Jane pointed out the way names had to be transcribed kept us very busy. So even when it was quite easy to see who Anne was talking about, we had to pay attention to the fact that she used special abbreviations for important people in her life, like Mariana or Isabella Norcliffe. Now, Anne used the abbreviation IN for Isabella Norcliffe in her plain hand all the time. But these abbreviations are more like nicknames, but how to make this transparent in the finished transcripts. So in this case, we use the abbreviation and add the complete name in brackets. But how does all of this affect the final version of the transcripts published? So uh, as Jenny mentioned before, the final transcripts of the journals go up in two ways. The first version is a PDF with the brackets for the omitted text or letters that aren't on the page, such as abbreviations, corrected spelling, translations, and other notations. The second version isn't supposed to include brackets, which makes it easier to read. And as you heard, it's also easier to search for words. Now let's see what this would mean in our example one. If the square brackets were simply removed, for the clean version, as in example two, the transcripts would look a little bit ridiculous and become unreadable because names would turn up twice in the same sentence. And that's why we had to find a solution and, and a solution which would prevent Jenny and Ruth 
from deleting the square brackets and then adding them again in the case of special abbreviations. And this is what the curly brackets are for. The checkers use them for all the words which require explanation and remain in the final clean version because the readers need them to understand who or what Anne was talking about. So to produce the final clean version, which you see below, Jenny and Ruth first remove the square brackets and then change the remaining curly brackets into square brackets. And you can see the final result, the clean version below. I'd like to talk about, about another typical example. And yeah, and that's Anne's abbreviation for Mariana's husband, Charles, when writing in code. In May 1825, and writes in code. Mariana married Charles without caring a straw for him. Now, in this case, we use the curly brackets in example one because the names Mariana and Charles Lawton remain in the clean version. We also had to replace the delta with an L, as you can see in example two, to prevent the online catalog from breaking. And of course, we don't want to make Ruth and Jenny's lives even harder. The, uh, <clears throat> the final result, the clean version, is example three, including the full names of Mariana and Charles. My final example is a very special margin symbol, which kept the code breakers and the checkers very busy. So for many years, especially in the early and mid 1820s, and Lister suffered from a venereal complaint she called from Mariana Lawton in 1821. And she used the symbol you can see here to track its appearance and her self-medication. Here I refer to it as E. So it's an important example of a symbol which evolved over the years. And we can also be thankful that Anne was kind enough to provide explanations regarding the meaning of the E. So the appearance of the complaint, the O, if there's no, or some discharge indicated by the dots inside the O and the dots below the E, how often she used the lotion she used for its antiseptic property. But in November, 1823, you can see that on the bottom right-hand side and suddenly employed additional dots in a different position to indicate she not only used the lotion, dots below, but also plain water, dots above. And that's why we had to discuss what to do with this and how we would visualize and tracker. I'd like to show you the final solution we all agreed on. So you see the E and the O symbol, and this will be transcribed with an uppercase for the E and a lowercase in O, both in italics. And then depending on where the dots are, they will be transcribed as above or below to indicate whether she used the alum lotion or plain water and how often. And example, what this looks like in the finished transcripts you can see on this slide. And this is from me and back to Janneke. Wow, thank you all so much for this wealth of uh, knowledge. I'm just going to quickly stop sharing my screen because we'll just have um, a... Um, little time for questions and answers. Um, so yeah, great, uh, mind-blowing stuff. Um, and just a quick question, Kerstin, as with the last examples that you gave with the E's and the O's, will there be a reference that we can read what the E's and the O's mean? Is yeah, some, absolutely. Yeah. And I think the one to answer that question should be Jenny. <laughs> uh, yes, so we have a glossary that we is available, so we'll be adding things like all, all the symbols such as the you know symbols to that so people can easily find that along with all the margin symbols brilliant so we can always refer to that great well we have some questions so um, i'm just going to dive straight in um so maybe for kirsten and for jane as uh, as checkers did you see did you maybe notice any patterns in the errors that you find um in the transcripts can you say something about that? Yeah, I, I see patterns in them all the time. Uh, each new batch that I get to check, I will notice something that stands out. 
uh, a frequent one is confusion about what to do with th words, because Anne wrote all of her, you know, this, that, these, them, they, using that thorn symbol, and then a little uh, sub, you know, superscript uh, for the last letter of the word. And you're supposed to, as a as a code breaker, as a transcriber, you were supposed to enclose in brackets the part she left out, but realize that that thorn symbol stood for TH. And this uh, caused a tremendous amount of confusion. And so we see uh, every possible configuration of things that can happen with the TH word. And in, when you get a batch, one of the things I do is just look at the two transcripts and see who did what with the TH stuff. So I'll, you know, I'll know right at the beginning what I'm looking for and I won't miss any of them to fix. Yeah, well, the good. first thing I'd like to say is, uh, so what we see, the mistakes, uh, when we started out as code, quake, uh, code breakers, we made these mistakes too. So that has been a huge learning process for everybody. And it, yeah, as I mentioned, it depends on when the code breakers uh, joined the transcription project. And it also depended on the guidelines they used to produce the transcripts. And obviously, these transcripts have changed. And it's as easy as this. The more you are able to transcribe, the better you become at it. And all of us uh, work full-time jobs, or most of us do. So uh, yeah, so I think sometimes it's a bit tricky to talk about mistakes. So it's simply a learning process for everybody. And it's simply, yeah, it's a huge honor to be part of this and yeah, to continue this learning process together. If I could add one thing to what Kirsten just said, which I completely agree with. If you want a lesson in humility <laughs> as a checker, go back and look at your own early transcripts. Oh my God, I made every mistake in the book. And then I made up some new ones. So, <laughs> you know, yeah. mistakes is, I mean, and we're still, I mean, we're still making mistakes. I'll come to a, a new batch to check and suddenly realize I did something wrong in the old batch, the one I've already turned in. So I'm really yeah. glad Jenny and Ruth are like looking at them even again one more time because all or whatever for whatever perfectionism we may personally you know ascribe to we still make mistakes yeah and also just uh be, i remember when i first got my batches that was quite far in the 1830s whereas some people have started in the 1820s and all these things and then later on i got batches in the early 20s so the time of where you're checking, regarding of whichever volume you're working on, there will be new people or people that just start, that was their first page ever that you're also looking at. And, and it's just very mixed, isn't it? So yeah, I recognize that. Um, there's a question about um, those situations where Anne wrote something, then changed her mind and thought, no, that's not what I meant, and then crosses it out. So how do you deal with those? <laughs> I can take that one if you don't mind, Jonathan. Mm. Uh, I was involved in the conversation about what to do with those. And believe it or not, those who know me will find this very hard to believe. I had an opinion about it. And my opinion was, if Anne didn't want it in the journal, why should we? <laughs> so if she crossed it out, we should ignore it. And I was soundly overruled. And I was convinced of the error of my opinion by Jenny, who said, but look at this one, Jane. Here she wrote, left her sore, and then crossed out sore and replaced it with satisfied. Left her satisfied. Now, wouldn't you want to know that Ann Lister did that? And I had to say, yes, I did. <laughs> so to answer the question, yes, I would like to know that. Uh, to answer yeah. the question, we now, if we can read it, we put it into the checked transcript with a, a strike through uh, so that we can tell she wrote it and struck it out. If we can't read it, we enclose it in curly brackets with the word illegible and strike that out so that it will end up in the final transcript bracketed and struck out and we'll know that Anne uh, tried to delete something. Yeah, great. 
Um, and maybe, um, Jenny, can you explain a little bit further? People were not quite sure what happens if we do leave a delta symbol in a text um, because we heard something about you so, know, crashing, but what, what happens? Yeah, one of the things we've learned along the process is how our own catalogue works. And for some symbols, the catalog takes it as a command and tries to run a process. I don't know what in the background and the page crashes. So Delta is one of those. Pi works fine, but Delta it doesn't like. So Delta we take out and replace with the capital L. Just to avoid meltdown in the yeah. system, right? Yeah, yeah. And we have, I mean, I, I remember on our transcription um, group in Facebook, I remember instances where people say, oh, we can't reach the pages, the system is down. And then later we learned from you, that was because a Delta snuck in somewhere. And <laughs> it, yeah, so. It, hap it happened with the very first uh, journal transcription that went online. And I remember Dan was so excited for it to go online and it, it told the code breakers and, and then it went up and everything crashed. And then it didn't go out the day we were hoping it go into. And it took a while to figure out that, that it was Charles was the reason. It, no, well, it would have been, wouldn't it have? Yeah, that was the problem. Um, now, um, let's have a look. I'm just trying to read and think at the same time, which doesn't go well for me necessarily. Um, yeah, this is a good one. So imagine that uh, people are new to the Analyster world and they really fancy this idea of transcribing, is there any way that they could be given a batch to transcribe or is that a no-no and people can just do their own thing? Um, I'd say we don't have sort of all of the transcriptions have now gone out. So we're not sort of sending out new batches of papers to be transcribed. But we would certainly sort of encourage people who want to have a go at transcribing themselves and reading the sort of original diary pages. Uh, we'd certainly, you know, encourage people to do that and uh, have fun with it. I have a good idea for people who want to do that. So you might have realized there are several blogs out there started by code breakers and who posted their transcripts. So a good idea if you want to get started is simply work on these pages on your own and um, compare your result to these code breaker transcripts, um, which are online. This gives you an idea what to look out for and you will see the more often you do it, the better you become. And that happens rather quickly. And, and, and the more often you do it, the likelier you are to become like a heroin addict. So once you start, be prepared to want to keep going. And uh, I, I think you know, Kirsten's uh, idea about a blog, that's a great idea. A, a number of people who were not code breakers have gotten in touch with me to ask uh, you know, if I have any advice uh, how they could get started and I you know I'm very happy to have uh, and respond to uh, inquiries like that I know Jenny and Ruth would be the same and Kirsten Yannicka uh, it's fun you'll enjoy it uh, and there's just nothing quite like reading the journals in Ann Lister's own handwriting and in her own code it's a richer Absolutely. experience than reading a transcript yeah, I would certainly agree. And and the the code breaker hashtag on Twitter and the Facebook groups are still there. You can always drop questions there and ask for advice. And absolutely, that's great. Now, I have been given a little warning that we are running um, near to the end of uh, this session. Um, but I have, uh, well, actually, Kerstin has a little bit of a surprise uh, <laughs> to tell you about. And for that reason, I'm just going to share my screen once more. Kerstin, take it away. Yes. Okay, right. And this is my announcement, a very exciting announcement. The full transcript of Diary Aid is now live on the Archive Service online catalog. And uh, it's Diary Aid and it covers June 1824 till July 1825. And it's really exciting because that diary includes her upset with Mariana at Blackstone Edge her time in Paris with Mrs. Barlow, I can just say beware, and various other trips. So use the link, which should be in the chat box now, to go straight to the page where you can read either the fully marked up version or the clean, easy to read version. So this is our big announcement. <laughs> well, and so after that very exciting 
a bit of information. Um, all I can say is here is a way where you can reach um, both Jenny and Ruth and um, the other panelists as well um, for with any queries, any questions, anything you want to um, mention. Um, by all means, if you come across mistakes or if you see anything that you think isn't quite right in a in a transcript, let uh, Jenny and uh, Ruth know so that they can um, work on that. Um, and actually, with all that, I conclude this session for finished. And I was very pleased to have you all here. And thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to seeing loads of you in the rest of this weekend as well in some of the next sessions. Thank you.